All right. So this morning we are in the um, New Testament letter to the Hebrews. Uh, you may remember from previous studies that we do not know who the author of Hebrews is. Um, and, and that's one of the things about New Testament scholarship that is fairly clear and certain. There are a lot of controversies, but for the most part, scholars may speculate about who the author might have been, but most agree that we really don't know who it was. We do know from the quality of the letter to the Hebrews that this person had strong Greek uh, education and understanding as well as solid Hebrew understanding, and that this is a letter that uniquely in the, in the New Testament seemed to integrate those two cultures as it presented the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, and so we come this morning to the very beginning of this letter um, and to uh, a passage that is an interesting concept. And I think for me, an interesting challenge as we think about Advent, because this lesson is about how Christ, how Jesus is superior to angels. Part of the challenge of that concept in 2021 is angels are not such a big deal in most Protestant churches these days. It's not that we disrespect them, it's just that they're kind of peripheral in, in the way most people think about spiritual and religious issues. Now there are of course some uh, denominations and there are some individuals who put much more emphasis on angelic presence and activity. And that's not heretical or blasphemous, but it's also not typical across Christendom um, that, that angels are respected for the role that the New Testament describes for them, but kind of beyond what we read about them in the New Testament, most people don't really spend an awful lot of time thinking about angels. But the reason that Hebrews, the letter to the Hebrews begins with this concept is because in the days after Jesus' resurrection and ascension, angels were actually much more significant to the Hebrew people as well as to new, new Christians. And one of the issues that the author of Hebrews felt compelled to manage, to deal with, was the fact that the angels needed to fit into the proper perspective about who Jesus was and what role the angels played in the relationship between Christians and, and the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, and I really feel that the, the very best summary of this lesson is a quote from um, Judson Edwards, who writes the commentary for this lesson for Smith and Helwes. And he said, we must believe and remember that Jesus is the best and most complete revelation of God that humanity has ever seen. That if we want to know who Jesus, who, who God is, then we look to Jesus and the characteristics that the New Testament and, and writers since then have lifted up for our understanding and consideration. And so the whole intent of the passage that I'm about to read is the author of Hebrews writing to new Christians that yes, angels are important. I don't want to diminish their significance in your understanding of God, but they are not more important than Jesus Christ is. And we have to look to Christ as the imprint, the revelation of who God really is for us. So let's look at the passage this morning. Hebrews 1, uh, beginning in verse 5, and then reading to the, um, into the second chapter of Hebrews, verse 3. And I'm going to be reading from the New Century Version. And I'm actually going to begin with verse 4. I'm not sure why the editors didn't. The Son became much greater than the angels 
And God gave him a name that is much greater than theirs. This is because God never said to any of the angels, You are my son. Today I have become your father. Nor did God say of any angel, I will be his father and he will be my son. And when God brings his firstborn son into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. You might notice that is the title of our lesson today. This is what God said about the angels. God makes his angels become like winds. He makes his servants become like flames of fire. But God said this about his son. God, your throne will last forever and ever. You will rule your kingdom with fairness. You love right and hate evil. So God has chosen you from among your friends and he has set you apart with much joy. God also says, Lord, in the beginning you made the earth and your hands made the skies. They will be destroyed, but you will remain. They will, wear, they will all wear out like clothes. You will fold them like a coat, and like clothes you will change them. But you will never change, and your life will never end. And God never said this to an angel, Sit by me at my right side until I put your enemies under your control, all the angels are spirits who serve God and are sent to help those who will receive salvation. And then into verse, into chapter 2. So we must be more careful to follow what we were taught. Then we will not stray away from the truth. The teaching God spoke through the angels was shown to be true, and anyone who did not follow it or obey it receive the punishment that was earned. So surely we will be punished if we ignore the great salvation. So in a way, there are really two parts to this particular passage that they have lifted up for us to study. And I'd like to sort of make sure we recognize both of those. The, the first one, which is the balance of chapter 1, is really helping us identify who Jesus is. And especially, as I said earlier, to clarify the fact that as important as angels were, Christ was superior to them, especially as the revelation of who God actually is and how we relate to God ourselves. What we see in the beginning of chapter 2 is an important caution from the author who says... You know, part of the issue in us making Jesus Christ superior in our own lives is that we pay careful attention to who he is and what we are taught. What the author is really addressing here, interestingly, is that um, one of the concepts he has is that People rarely, once they have become aware of Jesus, may have even made a commitment to Christ about it, rarely just suddenly say, oh, forget about it. I don't believe in that anymore. But what does happen to many people, and what the author of Hebrews is addressing here, is that people drift away. The word in one of the translations is stray. Uh, the, the new King James uh, itself um, actually says, drift away. And, and it's an important concept because as the author sought to encourage followers of Jesus, he was trying to say to them, be very careful because if your faith and your practice diminish, it's probably not going to happen all at once in a crisis. It's probably going to happen because something becomes superior to Christ as a priority in your life, and that thing becomes essentially an idol in your life, and you drift slowly further and further away from that. 
And, and so as we consider this as part of our Advent journey, the, the two things are to recognize, are there ways in which we have allowed things to become more important than Christ in our lives? And, and pray consistently that God will bring that into our awareness, bring our attention to that, and then give us the grace and direction to realize what may be supplanting Jesus as a priority and how we renew our allegiance to him, our commitment to him. Um, the, one of the sources I used uh, this week is um, the commentary from William Barclay. Um, this was a gift, a precious gift from Trevi uh, and Herb Brownlee to me. Uh, Herb had the complete collection of all the New Testament commentaries written by Barclay. And, and uh, about six months or so before Herb's death, they contacted me and said, would you like to inherit uh, the commentaries? And I was so blessed because it's, I love William Barclay. I had some of his commentaries even before they gave me his New Testament collection. But was he really? Wonderful. Oh, what a blessing that must have been. Yeah. He loved it. And so... One of the things that really enhanced my understanding of this, and I'm really jumping to the second chapter first, um, but this, this concept really helped me um, assimilate and integrate this thing about drifting. He talks about the fact that, uh, and, and the words in the New King James talk about transgressions and discipline or um, disobedience. And... Dr. Barclay discriminates and said, transgressions are something that we tend to do deliberately. We know it's wrong and we do it anyway. Disobedience tends to be more of a kind of unwillingness or a resistance to God's will. But either way, they affect our relationship. And he writes about it this way. He says that they have several meanings, but one of the meanings has to do with a nautical meaning. Um, the, the word for transgression can also be in, 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 interpreted as to moor a ship securely at a dock. Uh, and the second one, disobedience, can be used of a ship which has been carelessly allowed to drift past a harbor or a haven because the mariner has forgotten uh, to allow the wind, forgotten to allow for the wind or the tide. And so then what happens is the, the boat begins to drift into dangerous territory. And he says, so then I might translate this word of this verse this way. Therefore, we must more eagerly anchor our lives to the things that we have been taught, lest the ship of life drift past the harbor and be wrecked. That's a really powerful translation for me. And, and I think becomes so much more contemporary in terms of understanding what the writer of Hebrews was trying to say. And I think that certainly as I look at the flow of, of my Christian journey, there have been times when I have been less inclined to make Christ's commandments and teachings and guidance the primary influence in my life. Um, I remember especially when my three kids were at home. And so Sandra's teaching, which is a 70-hour-a-week job. I was a psychologist, which was a 70-hour-a-week job. We had three kids that we were trying to take care of and help through school. And, you know, at that point, I have to recognize as I look back that there were times when... Uh, my devotion to God was a little bit more hit and miss than I wanted it to be. Uh, and I'm just grateful that he loved me and cared for me enough that he kept me close even when I was not paying attention. But that's what the author of Hebrews is talking about here, is that we feel that connection to God, that intimacy with God, when we are paying attention to what we've been taught about who he is. And I think that is really, for me, a central message in our Advent pilgrimage this year, 
is to recognize that while God is always present, our awareness of his presence and his influence in our lives depends on our voluntary attention to what's going on. God does not force himself on us. He does not force himself, does not force us to think about him. He is always there. He always loves us. His grace is always sufficient. But unless we make the effort to pay attention and recognize his presence in our lives, then we don't know that. You know, God makes that a choice that we have to make with him. And so the writer of Hebrews is here reminding us that we may drift into maybe if not a deliberate disobedience, a kind of, well, I don't have time for that right now, Lord. You know, and in the process, there's this gradual drifting away. Um, you know, I, as I was reading about this and identifying it in my own life, I couldn't help but be reminded of the number of couples I worked with when I was in practice who literally have said the words to me, we just drifted apart. There is no crisis in our lives. We don't hate each other, but we just don't feel connected anymore. And I, th I think that can happen in any relationship, including in our relationship with God, because God has created us with a free will to either practice allegiance and priority with him or choose not to. So to me, that is probably the, the supreme aspect of our lesson this morning. Now, having said that, let's go back and look at the presence of angels um, in, in the lives of the Hebrew people, the Jewish people to whom this letter was written, and understand why the author was so compelled to talk about Jesus being superior to the angels. Another concept that I'm indebted to Dr. Barclay for that really helped me understand this more fully is that as people in Jesus' day believed in the power and the presence of angels, one of the concepts was that God himself was transcendent to the point of sometimes being unknowable or unreachable or beyond our ability to communicate with him. And so the angels were perceived by the Jewish people of that day as the intermediaries. They were the spiritual beings that allowed God to communicate with human beings and brought God's messages. They were also the intermediaries that lifted human prayers up into God's awareness and God's presence. Um, it's, and, and as the, the author tries to help people put that into perspective, what we see here is a series of citations from the Old Testament about who the Son of God really was. Uh, and actually in the New Century Version, the translation that I have in this parallel Bible, one of the very nice features of this particular version is that the verse that is cited from the Old Testament is actually in the margin. So I can tell you which psalm a particular verse was connected to. And in fact, there were seven different verses or citations that are covered in Hebrews 1, 5 through 14. And of those seven verses, six are in Psalms. And the other one is in 2 Samuel, where it talks about Jesus being part of the lineage of David or the line of David. And so what the author did was to use the understanding of his audience, the Hebrews, of the Psalms, which, as you know, were a primary uh, order of worship very familiar to the Hebrew people because they sung those songs routinely in their worship in the synagogue and the temple. And they were familiar to the Hebrews. And the author chose those psalms very carefully to support the concept that the Son is closer to God, in fact, is a reflection of God more than the angels. 
themselves, although they are also spiritual beings. And so as the author talks about the perception of the Hebrew people back then, that God seemed to be sort of far away and, and not quite so accessible, but the angel allows us to have access to God, we look at some of the characteristics that we understood about angels, especially back in those days. One of the characteristics was that their primary role was to be messengers of God. And of course, even in our Christmas season, we have two very important uh, examples of that in the appearance of Gabriel to Mary to announce the virgin birth, but also the appearance of Gabriel to uh, Zachariah to tell him that Elizabeth was going to bear a son in her very old age, who we know as John the Baptist. Those were two examples of the messengers. Uh, we also have examples of the angels in the tomb when Jesus was resurrected, bringing the message to the women that Jesus was risen. And so we have several examples in the Bible of angels in their messenger role. But what the understanding of angels adds to that is that apparently based on a review of other Hebrew literature, angels were also assigned to many other roles. They were the managers of nature. There were angels whose job was to manage the stars. There were angels whose job was to manage the weather. There were angels whose job was to manage time. Um, and according to other Hebrew literature, the understanding was that there were millions of angels working to serve and support God. One of the roles that we have identified in the Bible is that the angels were often a council of consultants. When the New Testament talks about, let us let man know about this, the implication was that God was talking to his council of angels in making the decision to reveal himself through Jesus Christ. And so angels have multiple roles besides just being messengers. And because the ancient Hebrews believed in those different roles that were assigned by God to these spiritual beings, they had elevated angels sometimes higher than perhaps was originally intended to the point that some people almost worship the angels themselves. And that is why the author of Hebrews was so intent on making sure that the Hebrews had a proper understanding of the hierarchy, if you will, of Christ Jesus the Son and the angelic beings. And went to some lengths, starting with the Old Testament citations, to demonstrate how Jesus was superior to the angelic beings. And of course, one of the places where the, the author started was that if, and we're going to study this next week, by the way, in John, the Gospel of John, first chapter, it talks about, and in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and all things that were created were created by Him. And so, and, and even that citation is among those verses from the Old Testament cited by the author of Hebrews in asserting that Jesus really is and always has been superior to any angelic beings. Now, having said that, the author was not trying to undermine the legitimate role that angels played as messengers of God. Uh, and in fact, one of the ways in which messengers had various assignments, and I guess, thank goodness, there were millions of them, was even the Old Testament angelic understanding, and perhaps our current understanding, is the assignment of guardian angels, uh, which is a concept that is more popular in our day and time, to think about each of us having a guardian angel who uh, is present to attend to our needs and to be a messenger of God's grace in our lives. And yet, it's important even with that concept to sort of look at who we are in relationship to God and who we may be 
as we recognize the possibility of angelic presence in our lives. One of the really important concepts that the author sets out here in making this distinction between angels' role in the relationship with God and the Son's role as the perfect revelation of God is that, as I hope we understood earlier, the Hebrew understanding of angels made the angels intermediaries, which means for many Jewish people, angels came between the individual and God and were necessary in order for there to be communication both ways. Part of what the author of Hebrews is impressing on the audience of Hebrews is as a result of Jesus' birth and ministry and resurrection, there is no more intermediary except Jesus himself. Jesus is our intermediary. And Paul talks about that reality many times in his letters to the, to the early churches. Where, and my favorite uh, example of that is in Romans 8, where he says, And we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. And the Spirit knows what the mind of God is and represents the mind of man accurately to the Father. And so uh, it's important as part of our own relationship with God to realize that Jesus is our high priest. Jesus is our intermediary. Jesus is part of the Trinity and is God himself. And so we don't have to go through any angel or through any human being. Uh, I've had a number of friends who have become Protestant having been raised Catholic. And one of the things that influenced their conversion to Protestant faith is the idea that they didn't have to go through a priest in order to make a connection with Christ and that they could be their own priests in terms of understanding, worshiping, prayer, study. And, and this is one of the points that the writer of Hebrews is impressing on us and on, on his audience of Hebrews that we do not have to go through angels. We do not have to go through another human being. Jesus' birth, his presence on earth, and his resurrection uh, back into spiritual form means that Jesus is our connection to God, and he is God himself. And so we have, God is no longer transcendent and distant from us, and we are able to go to him more personally and more directly. And it's part of what we really treasure about our relationship with God, that because he knows us intimately anyway, we don't have to try to keep secrets from him. As I have thought about some of my friends who were uh, converts from Catholicism, and, and I don't dis, disrespect or disagree with Catholicism, but it is what they have described. One of the things that I realize is that if... I were required to go through another human being in order to connect with God, there are likely some things I would never admit to about my thoughts and feelings that I would be ashamed to disclose even to a priest who may be called God. But since God knows my thoughts at the very moment that I think them, then I don't have to worry about withholding information from God. I can, I can be honest with God and learn to be honest with myself and trust that I am loved completely in spite of my flaws and limits and weaknesses. And this really is a very crucial part of the gospel message. As we witness to other people, I think it's very important that we are able to say to them, God loves you no matter what. And you don't have to go through anybody else in order to communicate with him. And in order for him to communicate with your mind and your heart. Now, he may use other people 
as a blessing, as a way of communicating with us. He may even use angels to communicate with us. But we, don't, we are not limited to angelic intervention. We are not limited to what another human being can do for us in order to have an open and honest, a trusting and loving relationship with God. And that's really the message that the writer of Hebrews is attempting to convey. And as I said at the beginning, as, as I began to study this lesson, I felt a little bit of, um, of confusion and, and a bit of puzzlement because I have to admit, I'm one of those modern day Protestants who doesn't spend an awful lot of time thinking about angels. And I was thinking to myself, so, so why did the editors at Smith and Helwes decide that part of our Advent journey this year would be to study about angels and their role in, in our relationship with God. But what the authors are really doing is to lift up the concepts that we don't need to reply, uh, rely on angels in order to have a relationship with God, but that the superiority, the priority of Christ in our lives is really essential so that we don't drift away and make a wreck of our lives because we're not following the directions and the commandments of God that are really intended for our own best interest. And so today, as we look at our relationship and our, and our progression through the Advent season, these are some thoughts that may help us organize and focus what we do as we move uh, into the Advent season as we re-examine our relationship with Christ and, and allow Him to change us in a special way. I think one of the challenges that, that is a positive thing would be for us to look at this passage and to ask ourselves in a process of introspection, of self-examination, are there ways that I become distracted and allow aspects of my life to become so important in a moment that I may miss the message that God's Spirit, that the Holy Spirit may be seeking to teach me. Uh, which is, I think, the contemporary version of saying, well, I can't be connected to God unless the angel connects me. Uh, I think we, we, first of all, learn from this to take responsibility for our own relationship with God. And then secondly, to, in the, looking at the first chapter, to realize that we are human beings. We are tempted to make other things more important. And that part of the power that God invests in us through His Spirit is the ability to self-examine, to be introspective, and to say, Lord, are there ways in which I am making other things so important in my life that I am missing what you are trying to say and do with me? Can you think of some examples of things that we sometimes allow to become so important that we might be missing God's voice in our lives? A busy schedule. A busy schedule, yes. That's something that in, in my own personal reading of spiritual writers in the last two years, that's a concept that is frequently mentioned is that our lifestyle, our culture is so busy, 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 that we sort of live moment to moment and we don't always pay attention to God in that moment. Distractibility because of busyness, they describe as a major problem for most Christians today. Yeah, yeah. That's true. That's true. As we go to the computer to do it more quickly, we get caught in the computer's <laughs> communication with us, and we spend too much time and give it too much power, don't we, Gene? Yeah, we do. 
Well, well, one of the revelations for me some years ago came from reading Oswald Chambers' famous devotional book, My Utmost for His Highest. And there were a series of devotionals during a particular week that really, um, as I thought about it, nailed me because what the devotionals addressed was the fact that our families are perhaps the second most important priority that God sets in our lives, second to Him. But that sometimes our families become the first priority. And he talked, I remember one particular daily devotional was particularly uh, ins insightful and incisive for me because what it said was, be very careful when a family member that you love very much is struggling with a particular issue that you don't jump in and save that person from the trial because that trial may be there because God has something to teach that person. Yes, you should be there to love them. Yes, you should be there to support them and encourage them. But very often, parents especially, and even spouses, have a tendency to want to step in and save people from a difficult situation. And the devotional from Brother Chambers was basically saying, be very careful about how you do that, that you don't make the comfort of your family member, the peace of mind of your family member, so important that you interfere with God's work in their lives. And, and I remember being very struck by that because all three of my kids were still at home and two of them were teenagers and had abundant problems that I wanted to step in and <laughs> rescue them from. But I remember thinking part of keeping God as a priority is that when I prayed about my role as a father in helping them deal with the problems in their life, that God would be the priority in directing me about what to do. Uh, and some days that was not the case. Some days I put on my psychologist hat and I tried to come up with a human solution for their problems. And, and eventually God would convict me of that misperception and, and ask me to look at things from his point of view. So that's an example from my earlier life of how I would sometimes let my human perspective be superior over God's perspective. Well, as we, as we continue through this Advent journey, we have another week until we celebrate his birth on Saturday. I hope that the ideas of understanding things that may supplant Jesus' priority in our lives, in our, in our daily walks, will be something that will help us be more attentive uh, to that process and that we will be educated and convicted about how we may be drifting away from his priority as we love him and worship him in this season of Advent. And, uh, and I hope that we will all continue to remember the, the name of Jesus, Emmanuel, and realize that all that, that label, that name of Jesus is most often used during the Christmas season because we celebrate him coming to us as a human being, that he is with us 24-7, 365, as the kids say, and that this is simply a time when we celebrate him being with us in a very special way. And also to remember that the reason for this candle is to remember that Jesus is the light in our own lives, uh, and also the light of the world, and that this is a time of year when we can share that light with other people. So I hope each of you has a wonderful and blessed Christmas celebration, um, and I look forward to seeing each of you that is that can be here next Sunday morning. So thank you for your presence this morning.